Well, welcome to the daily lecture. It's part of AGU's Bowie lecture series. It's one of the pleasures of being president of VGP, being able to first locate a daily lecture and then introduce them. Uh, as you can read up there, a little summary of Reg Daily by uh, Bob Hazen. He's a professor both at Harvard and MIT, wide ranging in his geological interest, traveled widely certainly from those, for those days from New, New England to both Pacific and Atlantic islands. But today, our daily lecturer, Chris Hawksworth, has an even more diverse career, I think, both in time and space. His research has included studies of Archean rocks, continental flood basalts, petrogenesis of arc lavas. And in recent years, his research has focused more on time scales of magmatic processes. And it's on this subject today that Chris is going to bring us up to date. And the title is Time Scales of Magmatic Processes. Chris? Thanks, Fred, very much um, for the invitation and the honor of being here. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back. And it's nice to be back amongst friends. If you read the European press, you hear a great deal about the differences, not the similarities of people either side of the North Atlantic. So it's nice to come back and remember uh, the similarities and the friendships, uh, rather than what we may read in our newspapers some of the time. So thank you. I'm pleased to be back. The, the list of people to thank is considerable, and these are only some. Um, Steve Blake, many of you know, Jim Elliott at Bristol, Rhiannon George is uh, currently married to Simon Turner, also at Bristol. Dan Morgan, you may not know, is a grad student at the Open University. Louise Thomas, also at the Open University. And Gail Zelma was at the Open University, then Bristol, and now at Le Mans. And these are the people who, in a way, started many of the analytical programs we're going to discuss. But there are also special thanks now that I'm in Bristol to John Blundy and Steve Sparks, uh, to Mark Reagan, who was over recently, and to John Davidson many of whom have also offered preprints for tonight's discussion, so that should also be acknowledged. We may fall very far of all this technology, so please be patient. What I wanted to do is start with the text on the left. I think we're very used to two things. We're very used to the long tracks of geologic time, which for many years lulled us into the suspicion that everything happens slowly and gradually. And what Van Andel highlights is just that change linked to plate tectonics. And what he says is then what we know depends on how well we can tell time. And that's true in a number of ways. Right? And one of the things that I want to question is whether we do use time well. Physicists and chemists amongst you are very used to the idea that to understand anything about mechanism, you have to understand rates of progress. If you turn to your neighbor, ask where they came from and how long it took to get here, provided in using these trains, you could probably work out the mechanism by which they got to be here. All right? So in geology, we have two choices. We have or two ways of using time. We have the descriptive thing, and that is we need to know our chronology. We want to know ages of important events in the history of the Earth. We want to know when man first arrived and so on. But do we use time well in a non-descriptive sense of trying to get at mechanisms? Do we set up models well that actually try and say this rate of progress or rate of change in this process will be different in one model than the next? And that's one that I, I'm not sure we do yet, but I want to highlight. Now, one of the areas where I think it does happen, and I'm not going to talk about much today because I'm talking about magmatic processes rather than melting, and that has been both in the application of short-lived isotopes to melting processes in mid-ocean ridge basalts and ocean island basalts, and also in island arcs. And what's that done, and some of the things are listed on the left, I won't go through them, but it has provided a series of testable models where time on the time scales of tens of thousands of years is crucial and where melts are extracted from different depths at different rates in different models. In island arcs, it may be even more extreme. We have a notion that we maybe get material in hydrous fluids off the slab up to the surface in a few thousand years, maybe 5,000 years. And we are poor at the moment at reconciling how that may be uh, integrated into, mo into models of melt generation within the wedge itself, 
where other arguments would say melting took much longer. But here again, if 5,000 years is real, then the constraints on the physics of movement of material becomes much tighter. But that is just, in a sense, the completion. What I want to do is move into magmatic processes. And just listed on the left is, if you stop and have a beer and ask what causes crystallization, these may be the things you come up with. It clearly happens in response to decompression as magmas come near the surface. It happens in response to degassing. And it happens in response to cooling. And in principle, those things may happen at different rates. Cooling may take much longer than crystals forming in response to degassing or decompression. And let me flag now, because we'll return to it, one of the things we have to bear in mind is whether we're asking questions about crystallization and rates of crystallization or about magma differentiation and rates of magma differentiation. And they're clearly not the same. And it may be that some crystallization rates are too fast for differentiation to then take place. So it's important to keep them separate in our minds. All right, those are the goals. What do we do? Here's an outline of Vesuvius. If we're tackling magmatic processes and we're going in the field and we're going to um, take you to volcano, how have people approached it? Well, one of the ways they've approached it is try to do detailed chemical stratigraphy, try to see how chemical changes take place with the eruption history of the volcano and say, this batch of magmas are actually interrelated but the next batch aren't, and so on, and try and get a time scale from the eruptive time scale. The other way they do is to show the isotopes we've touched on already, and the third way up here is to use trace elements for diffusion studies on how old are individual crystals. So if we start on the right, it's kind of dark, but the things that people have done, who's smart in the audience, so crystal size distributions. I mean, one of the things, well, let me back off. One of the things we have to appreciate, I think, is that there's two kinds of dating going on in here. If you talk to an isotope chemist, they will say what they do is absolute dating. Right? And they have a very accurate decay scheme. They give you ages which are in some way in theory, not model dependent. If you look at crystal size distributions, then you're going to have to have some control on rates of crystallization, whether it's constant or not. If you look at uh, diffusion, pro modified profiles of trace elements and minerals, you're going to get a time that a mineral was at a certain temperature. When that was, actually, you don't know, but you sort of assume it was the day before eruption. All right? So that, in a way, is a relative um, age that you're trying to work out how long it was. Ages of crystals and ground mass are clearly an isotope uh, way of can we date them. And the other thing that we do, and we'll come back to, is we use uranium, thorium, radium isotopes, not just to date crystals, but also to see how they may change with time and with composition in suites of related magma. So that, in a way, is the portfolio of um, tools we have in the trade, if you like. But the other thing to keep in mind is on the left, and that is, what are you trying to find out? And clearly, different questions posed by different people need to keep this in mind. I mean, one of the early studies on um, short-lived isotopes was with people like um, Dave Pyle, who assumed steady state and then used short-lived isotopes to tell you what residence times were. So that, in a sense, would be a way of getting mean residence time of magma en route to the surface. It may not have done anything, all right? It was simply a way of getting a handle on how long it took the mean this pile of magma to get through the crust um, on, on the way to the surface, whether or not it differentiated. We might, therefore, have a magma that sat around without changing composition in the crust, and we might try and um, look at that. We, as we've indicated already, might look at a series of lavas where the composition changes and get the time implied by uh, how long that would go on for. And to end at the top, we can take out crystals out of individual rocks. And in theory, we can date them. Must be Dave's cue. 
you may reasonably say that not everything travels electronically across the North Atlantic. Um, but um, teamwork is the essence. The kind of place that we're trying to get to is summarized on the right here. If we look at what was in the literature, a year ago at least, then there are a series of differentiation timescales depending on whether how primitive your rock type is, okay, whether you're dealing in basalts, how easy it is for the magma to get to the surface, which you may or may not say is related, and you can set up then, you know, over a few years maybe to differentiate on Iceland if you believe there led to 10 data coming through to a few hundred years if you believe radium data on K-thosyl fractionation through to uh, one or two hundred thousand years for differentiating to high silica rocks. And we'll return to that. But what is in a sense also illustrated for these data is on the graph on the left where here we have the pre-eruption ages of crystals, all right? If we just look at the red dots, these are the ages of these different crystals at the time of eruption from an isotope scheme we look at shortly. And along the bottom is silica plus aluminium as an index of differentiation, partly because it's linked to viscosity. And what you see if you look at the red dots is exactly what's summarized on the right, is that actually it's very hard to see anything that is very much older than eruption in minerals from mafic materials. But when you get to more evolved rock types, you have a big range of ages of crystals in those rock types. So one of the things that which links to here too, that you might infer is simply that it takes you some time to differentiate to high silica magnets. Right? And these crystals are a record of that process. Now the difficulty with crystals, and we'll come back to it in a second, is trying to be sure what their relationship is to the liquid you're dealing with. The crystals are the pretty things you see in thin section. The crystals are the repository of much of petrography and petrology and what we do. But linking crystal chemistry sort of band by band by band within a crystal to an eruptive sequence is notoriously difficult. All right? So linking crystal chemistry to time scales of differentiation, if that was the question, is a problem we'll come back to. You might just say, well, these magmas are more viscous. Of course, they're going to collect old crystals and not lose them, all right? And this is a quirk of the change in viscosity, not a change in process. These things are also viscous. They all drop out. But these are first order observations that we have to explain. The other thing, and we'll return to it, is this bold blue band that says magma differentiation times in some cases all the way through. And what this flags, and we'll come back to, is that if you took, let's say, strontium and helium isotopes in a suite of lavas from one volcano and they were different, you would throw your hands up in horror and you'd have different sources and crust contamination and all sorts of external processes put into the system. The advantage or the disadvantage of having short lived isotopes is that if your system was going to last for a few tens of thousands of years, that will be long enough to change the isotope composition of your magma by aging. All right? So then you can do it arguably in closed system and get age information instead. So one has to think differently as one uses these short-lived isotopes. All right, I mentioned crystals. And these are from John Davidson and uh, from uh, Tepi et al. in German Petrology. And what John Davidson has done clearly is build on the notion that crystals are the repository of what we do in many cases in uh, evening spectrogenesis. They have complex images of zoning which clearly reflect the evolution of the magmas that they were in equilibrium with. We're used to doing it in terms of the anophyte content of pegetase and so on. Increasingly, they're doing the trace elements and how they may vary. And what John Davidson and colleagues have done is show that if in this case, if you drill out small portions, then the strontium isotope ratios also have a stratigraphy in these crystals. Right? And as a descriptive part of process, that's fantastic. All right? It's hard to put time on it, though. All right? And it's quite hard may be impossible to actually say that if this is our magmatic record, can we see it in the lavas? People have tried, and I'm not sure when it's been successful. 
this technique has now been improved, and we can now do it with lasers, and many people in this room may be doing it the same, and here's a traverse, again, by John Davis and his group, you know, across, uh, across the feldspar, with the strontium isotope clearly being high in the middle, low on the margins, and you can certainly set up a, a model in which you have contaminated magma in the, in the crystallizing in the chamber, and eruption is triggered by the emplacement of low strontium isotope material, more matic material, and would trigger eruption. But it is hard to put on timescales. Right? So it's hard to get through to the age information that we're seeking. All right. Let's look briefly then at the isotope systems people use. Most of you are familiar with this. Clearly what we're concentrating on is short-lived isotopes, in this case thorium-230 and radium-226, within the decay chain of uranium through to lead. And they have half-lives, 75,000 years, 1,600 years, and there are others that are shorter that are not on this slide. So we can get in on processes that are on the time scale of tens of thousands of years, five times the half-life as, as a guideline. And we present them, I guess, after Florida Leg and others, on what's normally called an isochron diagram, an equiline diagram, where here we have uranium over thorium, effectively, against 230 thorium, which is also radioactive, and 232 thorium. And what this uh, diagram highlights is really three conditions which we may use at different stages. One is if, if everything is in isotope equilibrium and these isotopes have not been disturbed within the last few hundred thousand years, then the thorium isotope ratio of any sample will depend on its uranium-thorium ratio. So that all the rocks in red here, which have range in uranium-thorium ratio, will have particular thorium isotope ratios equivalent to equilibrium. And that's kind of when you get no information, except it's too old to worry about. What you hope for in geochronology is that you get some kind of straight line which has, is the slope of which has age significance. And this would happen if you had a composition here, a, a magma, let's say, and you fractionated uranium thorium to low values and uranium thorium to high values. So at zero age, they would be horizontal. And then as you decay back onto the equiline, down this side and up that side, you get a straight line that rotates back towards the red dots. So in that case, the slope of this straight line is an isochron. You can use it as you would use any other isochron to get age information. But actually, and it's one of the great difficulties with the system, it's quite hard to change uranium-thorium ratios. Most magmas, both highly incompatible. So often what you get instead is some melting process that takes you up to the top here, takes you off the line in some vertical shift so that your new magma out of the mantle has an isotope disequilibrium. And if that magma just sits around, it will decay back onto the line. All right? So you can, do, you can also get time information by the rate of change of isotopes back into equilibrium. Right. And I guess, given what I said already, then you'll see where we're heading. So there are two ways to get information for now. One is to get an isochron, and the other is to see how the distance away from this equilibrium line changes with composition or eruption history or whatever to get time out of it. All right. The other great difficulty with all geochronology is that in a way, if you don't know what you've sampled, you're not going to learn anything by analyzing it. It's an old truism, all right? But if you don't understand the petrography, if you don't understand how one mineral relates to another, if you don't know that two minerals are related to another and you try and date them, you're in deep trouble because you're putting things on the same isochron that shouldn't be. So on the right here, it's from Dave Pete and Jerry Wasserberg and people, is it an example where they have some whole rocks and they've taken magnetite out of the ground mass and are therefore confident that it is linked to eruption. And so they get an age that is the age of eruption of a New Mexico rock of importance to geomagnetic studies of 159 plus or minus 29,000 years. And that's fine. That's geochronology working well. It's giving an eruption age and an age that is too old for carbon and it has a role. But you have to be very sure what you're sampling. Of greater complexity and much less well understood was a study by Emily Heath and others who took um, a series of minerals here in the orange from sweeps of rocks from Sufri and St. Vincent in the Lesser Antilles ranging in age back to 4,000 years 
And that isochron, which is the same for individual rocks all together, is about 50,000 years. So here we are in the position that rocks erupted in the last 4,000 years have minerals that are 50,000 years old. What does it mean? Maybe it does mean that minerals were sitting around in rocks for 50,000 years and, and just that's the time scale. But not many of you are going to believe that. The, the great isotope escape hatch is to say it's mixing, it has no age significance, whereupon this end is fine, it's like the whole rocks, but this end doesn't have whole rocks to offer to be the other end of the mixing line. So mixing is possible, but it's not understood why. And this is an arc. So the uranium thorium ratio should be high and it would be odd to get low uranium thorium ratios in a liquid in an arc. Possible, but no evidence for it. So that's a dilemma. Those data are out there. And in truth, it's not clear what to do with them. You can say maybe the system was on the go for 50,000 years, maybe not. You think back to your first year lectures in isotope geology. I mean, if you were actually wanting to believe in age from geochronologists in the old-fashioned sense, you would ask them to come and give you an age with another decay scheme. You would ask for some kind of concordance of ages all right, between different systems. And so one way to go would clearly be, can we see systems where we get the same age from different decay schemes? You certainly can't do it here. But one place where you can is to, for, is to look at what uh, Hornman and uh, Davies did in the African Rift Valley in Kenya, where they looked at peralkaline rhyolites erupted 8,000 years ago. And I just offer this as one way of trying to reconcile these debates. And here we have a strontium isotope diagram, and here we have these very high RBSR ratios, familiar to those of you working in the Western US. And we have glasses that lie on a line through Sanadine and Amphibol, you know, reasonably. And it, these are two eruptions from a slightly different age falling on two crude lines. So here is a system that gives you an age of uh, 24,000 uh, years plus or minus one. You might want to speculate that the one tells you about how fast differentiation took place within that time scale, but then you have to be very sure that all these rocks were genuinely related and there are all sorts of assumptions behind that. But the good news is that they then went and did uranium thorium isotopes, it's the same diagram you've seen already, uranium thorium against thorium isotopes, here's the equilibrium equiline, and they got biotide amphibosanidine quartz, magnetite and glass to lie on a line, which is an isochron, which is 25,000 years in error of the RBSR isochron. That's very encouraging. It happens very rarely. Uh, okay. But the bad news is, if you think about it petrologically, is that this is a fractionation to make you high RBSR glasses. That's fine. It happens all the time, as they say. This is very hard to fractionate in those minerals. What this actually depends on is the amount of chefkinite as an accessory phase you have in those major minerals. All right? So while isotopically you can pat yourself on the back and you've got the same age, you have to be aware petrogenetically that this is clearly fractionation to high RBSR of these kind of minerals, while this is a distribution of an accessory phase chefconite in otherwise perfectly respectable minerals, which on their own would not change uranium thorium ratio enough. So it's good that the ages agree, but just to flag that um, isn't quite as rosy as it might be. And just to put that up on the right, so if you summarize what they did, they have these high RBSR peralkaline rhyolites, they get concordant ages, they do reflect fractional crystallization, but also the distribution of chefconite. But either way, the ages are 15,000 years before eruption, and they have a small magma reservoir, 2 to 10 cubic kilometers, which appears to have survived for that period of time. All right, that in a way is concordance, and ideally that's how we would like to tackle things if we had whole rock data. The other way to go in, and people have done, is to go into a mineral which you think you can see magmatic records in because they're highly zoned, and which have enough uranium and thorium to date either in situ at the iron probe or by separating out small amounts of sample. And the mineral is clearly zircon, 
and this is entirely fraudulent, these are probably Archean and they're probably from shrimp, but they make the point that you get zones in zircons which you can analyze in situ and get ages out on. And a uh, study for me as many in the audience is uh, Mary Reed et al's study on the Deer Mountain sequence uh, in Long Valley. Long Valley, a big debate about whether there really was magma residing for a million years or so before the Bishop Tuff was erupted. It was erupted too long ago to use these short-lived isotopes, so they have looked at stuff erupted 115,000 years ago and um, very recently. And these are iron probe data with the different symbols reflecting to the two eruptions. And their argument is simply that although the mean on an individual point is really quite big, it's of this kind of size, then the, sorry, the error is of this kind of size. The mean of all these data put together is of the order of 230,000 years. So here is zircons, interestingly, from two eruptions from the same magmatic sequence which if these are, you know, statistics apart, appear to cluster around roughly the same mean age, you know, which, you know, implies, I think reasonably, that these magmas cool through temperatures of about 815 degrees or so 230,000 years ago. Now the difficulty, and we'll come back to it, is being sure that they didn't crystallize then and were remelted. So the time scale looks real of the order of 100,000 years or 200,000 years during the eruption before eruption. We cool this magma through 800 degrees or so. The difficulty is working out whether the magma then stayed as a liquid through the rest of its history or whether it cooled and was remelted. And I think we can't always resolve that. So that's, that's a, a near local example, if I can do it this far away. And let us now look briefly at New Zealand, where people at the Open University were working, mostly in North Island. And partly this is also to, to highlight the issue about volcanic hazards and assessment and so on. Uh, Typhoid volcanic zone down the middle here, subduction related material due to subduction along this side, with some custom melts and rhyolites generated. Auckland up here was a very different magmatic threat. Auckland on the left, um, a city that has 53 from memory, small volcanic uh, uh, cone, cone centers, which in essence differentiated in the upper mantle and then just came out bang. Right? And trying to see when that was going to come out bang is clearly difficult. Down the middle of New Zealand, Rupe here in the back, Tongariro area here, you have these calc alkaline rocks differentiating at much shallow level, erupting quite frequently, and clearly things going on at shallow levels where you would hope to monitor them. And New Zealand again, an area where at least 120 years ago, North Island was covered in considerable thickness of volcanic material. So presumably that may well happen again. Now what Charlie and Zoma did was that they took zircons out of these rocks and on the right here, their results. So this is again the equiline diagram, thorium isotopes against uranium thorium ratio, the equiline, the whole rocks, and a range of zircons, which you probably can't see, but they change in size from up to 250 microns up here down to 60 down here. And that's the big end, that's the small end, and things grade on size in between. Now, if you were to believe the model ages, you would just draw a line between the zircon and the whole rock and get an age of 12,000 years before eruption and here you would say 5,000 years before eruption. And you might say, well the big crystals are the oldest, so this is just the crystallization history, all right? The big ones have been growing for longer, they crystallize with time and the ones that only just started growing are the youngest and they're the smallest. The difficulty is that if you look at those zircons, then in essence they have rims and cores as though they have two components. Right. So rather than view them as a, a record of continuous crystallization, it seems to be in two stages. Uh, 
Uh, if you look on the right hand side, this is the same diagram with the same data. If you were to take it as two stages and you were to fix it both with the thorium isotopes, you would extrapolate back that the core might be 27, 30,000 years old at time of eruption and the youngest ones were a, a thousand years, a couple of thousand years or so before eruption. So again, the point being that you need photography back to stage. Zircons are a very useful tool, all right? They're easy to analyze. You can analyze small amounts. But they have the difficulty of deciding how zircon crystallization history compares to some of the other phases. And they, at the moment, give slightly ambiguous data about whether this is a two-stage or a continuous process, which is what we're really after. But it certainly means, or the data certainly looks as though this has been continuously crystallizing at least since 30,000 years ago. So, summarized on the left, time scales of crystallization are similar to the half-lives of uranium isotopes. And the other thing I didn't say earlier, and which makes it different from potassium argon and iridium strontium and so on, is that we have this headache, which I've indicated already, that the time scale of the growth of the crystal is similar to the, to the half-lives of some of these isotopes. And hence this modeling to see how things compare with size. Model ages are five to 12,000 years before eruption. It might have been, as shown here, that we started 27,000 years before, if we had a core and a rim. But if actually, if you want to crystallize the whole thing continuously, and you want to just extrapolate back in time and retain a sensible thorium isotope ratio, you can extrapolate back to 120,000 years and have it going for 120,000 years. So the information is that both these zircon studies give us old um, information. All right. They both indicate that they might be talking about crystallization history that was at least 100,000 years before eruption. But it is hard to unravel whether the crystallization is continuous and we have to keep magmas going, or whether we solidify things and remelt them. All right, enough of those isotopes for the moment. The, the problem is that we don't quite high long time scales. Right? We're talking tens of thousands of years, which are what we can resolve isotopically. What happens if we go in and use different schemes to look at zones within individual minerals and see how ages of crystals, which are major phases in the evolution of the rock, may compare? So here's a, this is from Georg Zellner. Here's a Plagioclase from, um, from Montserrat, with complex zoning and rounded edges implying resorption as we go all the way through the history of this crystal. And what Georg Zelmer did was, in a sense, lift approaches used in metamorphic geology and try to see how the trace element profiles across zones of different anorthite content vary with equilibrium um, postulation or not. And if we accept that the calcium diffuses slowly, uh, that we can use the anorthite content to evaluate equilibrium, clearly for all of these zones, we can work out both what the initial barium content would be or strontium content, and what it would be if it had then re-equilibrated with the zone next door. Now we're not going into details, but here's the anorthite content variations across this crystal. Here is the calculated equilibrium profile you would expect for this anorthite content variation as you went across the crystal. And the black squares or the dark squares simply show that the barium abundances do not yet mimic the equilibrium profile. So this is time to go from the igneous state you start with through to equilibrium where you diffuse to between one anorthite zone and the next. And in essence, these minerals, and you analyze a number of them, give ages calculated this way of the, back to about 300 years. Right. So we have a range of ages in one rock, or in a suite of rock from one volcano, which range from the order of 10 to, to 300 years. Very much shorter than the age of the volcano, implying that rapid processes are going on, but quite hard to decide when the absolute ages of those processes would be. So let's see if we can improve on that and go to Vesuvius, how visible that is. At 1944, Vesuvius lava on the left, 
wonderful black and white pictures of Spitfires going over, which I don't have, but many of you may have seen. Herculaneum on the right with Vesuvius at the back. Present day city, as you see in the middle, and the buried Herculaneum at the base here. Now using the latest NASA technology, as they say in inverted commas, to unravel some of the burnt scrolls from one of the oldest libraries that they found in the material in here, where basically charred rolls of library material was found. Clearly, the big issue is this is going to erupt again. And what Dan Morgan has done is tried to explore what you can tell from backscattered images of, of final pyroxenes. Armish on the left, normal uh, Olga on the right, and a zone in between which starts paper thin and then broadens with time as you try and equilibrate one side with the other. And these are the major element profiles. Uh, where are we now? Yeah, iron rich on this side, going down to low iron in the middle. The point about this is that it's cheap, okay? It's actually better resolution than you can get with an electron probe because you can't get in here. This is 7.4 microns across, this, uh, all right, to, to document out. And you have a chance, therefore, of trying to understand the time scale involved of this zone broadening as you leave this mineral at the temperature that you infer from other things in the rock. So if we look on the right, this is a summary of the age data he gets. So this is now all out of one rock, which is an airfoil tephrite linked to 1944. And he has a range of ages, roughly 1944, in essence from in equilibrium back to 20 years before. 30 years before. Yeah, the distribution of ages in some of these areas are quite big clearly shows that most of them are, have crystallized at or around the time of eruption of the magma. But to get this amount of age information out of different minerals, different crystals from the same unit, at least opens new possibilities. We know this volcano erupted every year from 1913 roughly through to 1944, so there is an eruption sequence that we know about. The it's to explain this distribution where most of the minerals are very young either means perhaps that we have lots more magma coming in recently in order to crystallize those minerals or that the minerals crystallized back here in time have already been erupted. So there's a trade-off between the amount of material you're putting through the system which you can do from eruption um, history and, uh, and size of chamber. So you're beginning to get a sense of to explain this kind of age distribution, may you get a handle on process to summarize on the left. But these are how you get the ages from the diffusion gradients in pyroxene. Quick and cheap, you could say. Ages range like 15 years. And the age distribution, if you accept the volcanic history from 1913 um, or so through 1944, and the volumes erupted per year on a model are consistent with volumes a magma chamber volume of 0.1 cubic kilometer, which is what other people have got from other studies. So here is perhaps a new way of getting into um, processes and sizes of volumes from looking at age profiles in different crystals from the same rock. All right, let's change gear and look at how other ways in which people have tried to get a time scale. We've looked a little bit at um, what we can do nice topically in terms of crystals and fractionation sequences. We can look at the kind of relative ages we get out of diffusion studies in individual minerals. What other approaches have people used? Well, one, and it's also been used in Chile, has been this issue of chemical stratigraphy. This is Tongariro again in New Zealand, as we saw before. And their argument has simply been, by the Hobson and colleagues, that if you look at major element variations and you look at the age of eruption, 1970 through 28 to 49, 1954, 74, 75, and so on, that because that does not follow a nice trend of changing composition with time or even constant composition with time, you can infer 
but because you have complex and abrupt changes in chemistry, you have small size and a small short lifespan with many magnet batches coming through. It's unclear really how to easy this is to test, but it is an argument that's out there where people have been trying to infer time scales from eruption history. What else have people done? It's now time to embarrass your next president, probably. But there's, there's an, old, um, an old adage in some of our institutions in England that actually, as soon as you see color diagrams, you want to be deeply suspicious. The real ones come in black and white. And thank you, Dave. And this is partly because I had to get it by fax because I was recently disjointed from my colleague John Blunder. Um, so this is uh, Cashman and Blundy photographs on the right. This is uh, Pechio's felspar, which I understand is old cores and rapidly crystallized fels uh, felspar around the edges. But the point I want to bring to you, because this also has time information, right? This, this is summary of chemistry of mounts and homes, rocks and glasses from Blundy and Cashman and Cashman and Blundy, where in essence the squares here are whole rocks and the ellipses are all glasses. Better on the bottom, the ellipses are all glasses, the whole rocks are on another vector. So what that highlights, all right, is that the fractionation process responsible for the glasses was not responsible for the whole rocks. Right? And what they argue is that this magma comes up fast and that's a decompressor to degasses and you get rapid crystallization. And the point is that crystallization is too rapid for that fractionation process to differentiate your whole rock magmas. All right? So here again, from an argument that tries to compare glasses with whole rocks, yeah, we get a sense that the crystallization rate all right, is, so, is too fast for you to take crystals out and so differentiate the whole rock. All right. So the whole rock compositions were set up before, and as you bring it up, you presumably make it liquid, and then you crystallize it again, and as you look at the glasses that are left behind, they are on a different trend to the whole rock. So there is a way of seeing when crystallization is very fast, and I said earlier, too fast to maybe cause differentiation to take place at all. Thanks, Dave. All right, radium, let me just touch on for completion and uh, then stop. The other way one can do, look at time scales is to use radium because the half-life is uh, 1,600 years. So you get, in principle, get back into these much shorter time scales. But in detail, it's difficult. Here would be an isochron diagram of radium over barium and thorium over, over barium. The equiline you'd be back on. And here's a suite of rocks from Longinoff and Kenya from Pete Evans forming an isochron. The trouble is twofold. One is that the radium and barium don't have the same partition coefficients, so this is actually a doubtful way to make an isochron where the thing on the bottom should be behaving well relative to radium. And secondly, as Cooper and others have shown, if you take a mineral separate and analyze it for radium, much of what you're analyzing is in the glass and the melt inclusions and not in the mineral itself. So what they've had to do is to calculate the changing radium barium ratio in the melt that was in equilibrium with plagioclase, the melt in equilibrium with all guys in the ground mass with time, and see whether they overlap in order to get an age. All right? So you've got two issues going against you, or which make it difficult. One is that the partition coefficients are different when we hope they might have been the same. And secondly, you have this um, problem that the mineral separates you analyze are very dominated or have strong contribution from the glass. But in principle, that's a way of getting in closer. All right, just to finish with one final example and to link into some models. I just want to go to Tenerife where Louise Thomas worked. This is standing at the top at uh, 3,500 meters, looking down into a cold air that blew out 200,000 years or so ago. And this has a serious question about how do you sample these things. It's great to have these shore lived isotopes to be a test. They have half-lives that would look at things that change in a few thousand years. But here's a volcanic cycle that's 200,000 years old. The rocks are well-behaved. Here's an alkali silica diagram, a nice straight line, um, which you can do by fractional crystallization up to phonolite. So it's basinite up to phonolite. It's pretty well-behaved. But 
Right hand side shows how well behaved. This is just the same rocks. Rubidium against zirconium, a nice anal analogous uh, curve fractionation trend. And the barium highlights when the K Fell spot comes in and drops like a stone. It's not very interesting in its own right, but it's crucial if you want to talk about mixing. I mean, what it, mixing is straight lines and all these diagrams. And if you want to explain the isotopes away by mixing, clearly you might do it up here, but you're not mixing back across here easily at all. So it does look like a fractionation system for the most part, by like closed system, and therefore one of interest to try and find out how long that fractionation took. That's the good news. The more difficult news on the left, and this is a plot of eruption age since 160,000 years. Again, sorry, my suppose we ignore for a moment in silica. Now, these cycles are set up as basinite evolving to thermalite. All right, I mean, that's how they're recognized. So crudely, they follow this green line. The red dots are the samples actually taken by different groups of workers. And clearly, while you're on some you know, average green line that mapped out in the field, so to speak, as you would hope to be coming up through here, as you go from your base to night to foam light with time. That's how the things were defined in the field and set up. And of course, as volcanoes don't behave neatly, you know, at the very end of this cycle, or near the end in the last 20 or 30,000 years, there are some rocks erupted which are not thrown light, but which are less evolved. Now, we can look at thorium isotopes and see how they change. Okay, and they start high due to when they come out of the mantle, and as you fractionate up this trend, they decrease with time until you get to a thermal line. <coughs> The difficulty is, if you want to say, ah, let's go and test this with radium or a short-lived isotope, you can only analyze these young rocks. Now, if you analyze young rocks up here and you get isotope disequilibrium, do you say that the rocks are anomalous because they're not on the main trend of the volcanic cycle? Or do you say they tell you something about rocks erupted a long time ago which have lost their radium excess? Or how do you put them in the system at all? And I think that's unresolved and difficult. And whether it is useful to have, in very common, some normal chemical change with time in a, in a magmatic system, which is what your baseline is, and other things are anomalous or not, I think time will tell. But it is a serious issue when you come to try and test some of these models with different isotope systems. Thanks, Dave. So what this does is summarize the same data on thorium against zirconium. So this is your fractionation trend. And this is simply the thorium isotopes changing from when it was high in the parental magmas to simply decaying with time, naught, 100, 200,000 years, back down towards the phenolites. And that would imply that it takes 200,000 years to evolve from a baseline to a phenolite. And maybe as good evidence as you're going to see. If we look at the modeling, and this is early days, one of the ways to get at this, and we'll come back to it in a second, is to say that you can use the power output of volcanic systems because you think the whole thing is thermally controlled. Thank you. So, there's a thermal light from an ocean island. How does it relate to other high silica sweeps? Here, and I mean near a home and further afield. I think in general, whether you're in Long Valley and you have a million years or so of basaltic stuff before you get a rhyolite, you know, the Paraná, where you can almost, Paul and I might or might not make these figures up, but the rhyolites are the last things out, however much basalt went on beforehand. Centurion, Cent Tenerife, 200,000 years of volcanic cycle going on before, you know, ending in high silica material. So again, these cycles all say it takes time to differentiate. And in a way, a slogan to take away with you, that they, in essence, is that crystallization may be extremely fast, but differentiation appears to take some time. All right? and, and linked to that is then this diagram from Mark Reagan in a preprint form, which tries to summarize data from Central America, being Mark, Katmai, Cascades, and Santorini, on a diagram that shows that if everything was in isotope equilibrium, it would be on the line, which was one, but again, silica. And Mark's point is that if you look at mafic and andesitic rocks, there's a big range in isotopes. So the magmas you start off with have this big range. The way to get rid of them is for a radioactive decay. And therefore, if everything comes down to being back on the equiline by the time you get to rhyolites, 
it takes again of the order of two or three hundred years, to, two or three hundred thousand years to get there. All right. So this, if you like, co converging of the disequilibrium to the high silica rocks is at least crudely, at least crudely consistent with the stuff on the left-hand side. It does appear to take time to get to high silica. There have been lots of models, and I won't pause, about saying if you have lots of basalt going into a granitic magma system, you can keep it liquid for a long time. And Bedford and uh, Gallagher have modeled it recently, and, um, and that's fairly true, and you can probably do it at right uh, rates of uh, magma emplacement. This is a slide from Southeast Australia, Torres Bay, um, in 350,000 uh, million year old granitic material highlighting how this mating material comes into these granite systems and is fairly intimately linked in keeping this high silica system going. And I put it up to contrast with the fact that you can keep things liquid is now being assessed by Catherine Annan and Steve Sparks of Bristol, also from the preprint. And what they've done is look at the thermal history that if you have a slab of crust and you bring magma into a particular level at a sensible rate for your favorite iron dark, yeah, then the thermal history of that crust is modified. And in essence, over time, you heat it up and it starts to melt. Right? And once it melts, you can get high silicon magmas, you can get mixed magmas, or whatever. So, then their model, if you have an intrusion of uh, 50 meter sill every 10,000 years, an area of, uh, or at a depth of 20 kilometers, you have an incubation period before you get a crustal melt, depending on your rock types, of the order of one to two to three hundred thousand years. Melt volume is very variable, depend on the solids and volatiles, and you do get significant volumes from the basalts. All right. But so here again is a analytical model which allows you to see that actually one to two hundred thousand years is perfectly reasonable to build up the heat to get high silica magmas. But it also highlights that the magmas which are most likely to melt are the ones that crystallized yesterday because they're hottest. All right? So that it's very easy to have a system of bringing magmas in, cooling and crystallizing, bringing the next one in and trying to remobilize the one that's just arrived. So in a way, we have, I think, two models which allow us to cope with this apparent, this observation that appears to say, if you want to get high silica magmas, You've got to have the system going for some time in vertical commas before you get them. And whether you look that that number is true, whether you're looking at zircons, whether you're looking at the differentiation history at Tenerife, or whatever. Two models to explain it. The one that we looked at um, in Tenerife uh, with Steve Blake was simply to take the uh, summarize here on the left. The de facto crystallization is driven by temperature decrease you can link it to the thermal output power. And here's an equation of the time taken to, to cool through a certain amount of temperature, both the volume, the density, and so on, all the way through. You can look at the data from Tenerife, and the temperature of liquids is linearly related to the degree of fractionation. You can take that straight line, and so you can predict a linear correlation between cooling time and degree of differentiation and the data are not great, but you get a cloud, you put a line through it, you get a ratio of volume over power. So in a way, you have the possibility of saying, and now it is, if only I knew the power well, all right, you could get a handle of the volume that was fractionally crystallizing in order to release that power. And that's summarized on the right here for Tenerife. In essence, if the thing has been going for 200,000 years, we don't know the power output, but if it's in this range of 0.1 to 1 gigawatts, then the volume that you'll get to get down at depth is of the order of 400 to 400, uh, 4,000 kilometer cubed, and the volume of the shallow is at 19 to 200 kilometer cubed. Now, these are not made up. These are depths that come from experimental studies of these thermal lines. So it is perfectly reasonable to have most of the factory crystallization taking longest going on here, it comes up to a shallow chamber and fractionates with highly evolved thermal lines. And the point is that given this way forward, given a rough estimate in this huge range of what the power out might be, you have a way of saying, 
whether this would work over 200,000 years or not. Consistent with the volcanic cycle that you see in the field, and you might wonder why one started, one had that 200,000-year 200, uh, 200, cycle in the field in the first place. But you can make them link. All right, to summary and to wind up completely. What I think we do see is we have areas of, we have volcanic systems where we can get in and look at time scales which might be of the order of 1,000 years for Cooper's work on Hawaii, down to a year or two if we're looking at crystals in Montserrat or in, um, in Vesuvius, down to forming in uh, days or weeks, if I remember John Bundy's calculations, um, as things crystallize underneath Mount St. Helen. And then we have a group of higher silicon magmas, even the Mount St. Helens, with longer time scales, maybe 200 to 20,000 years. And the examples we've looked at from the African Rift, from New Zealand in Taupo, from Tenerife, and from the Western USA system. In essence, we have a quandary over melting versus long-lived chambers, which isn't, hard, which isn't easy to get through. And one of the ways may be in this chemical change with time that we've seen on Tenerife, whereby you do have a suite of rocks that are related by fracture crystallization, and you do have this time for the isotopes of decay while that happens. But it is fact. If you didn't know what the rocks were doing before you analyzed the isotopes, you wouldn't get started. Right. So you have to have a sweep that you think is related by fractional crystallization, and if you then apply the isotopes, you get the time scale of that happening. And again, you come back to this order of 200,000 years or so. So I think what we really do see is we see areas like the Mount Helen examples, like Vesuvius, where crystallization is so fast there actually isn't time for differentiation to go on. You can take it a step further and say if you want differentiation to happen, do you have to strike off decompression? Do you have to strike off degassing and say that should only be modeled thermally? But I'll leave that one for you to ponder. But at least it's an avenue that may be worth exploring. And I leave you then with uh, a little bit more optimistic view of time that uh, maybe we're beginning to get more keys to unravel the aspects of time. And luckily, completely in the dark here, it doesn't really say butcher AGU, but it does say welcome to Nice next time. This is Max Cove and Jason Fitzwalk and myself and John London. Thanks very much indeed.